This is not your typical underdog story. This is the tale of Iman Gadzi, a self-made internet millionaire who went from a tough childhood to making $100,000 a month at just 18 years old. But as his fame and wealth grew, so did the questions about his business practices and the truth behind his rags to riches narrative. Iman didn't have an easy childhood. His mum raised him alone and his dad and stepdad were not nice to him. But this made Iman grow up fast. He got interested in business when he was very young. When Iman first started, he made a company that did photos and videos for people. But then he learned about something called a social media marketing agency, or SMMA for short. With an SMMA, you help other companies with their social media, like Facebook and Instagram. You make posts and ads for them and help them get more customers and make more money. So Iman started his own SMMA called IAG Media, and he was really good at it. By the time he was just 18 years old, his company was making $100,000 every month. That's when Iman became a millionaire. Most people would be super happy with this and just keep running their successful company. But not Iman. He wanted even more. Iman saw that a lot of people were making a ton of money selling courses online. These courses would teach other people how to start their own businesses. So Iman took what he learned from his SMMA and turned it into a course. He called it Agency Navigator or sometimes Agency Incubator or Grow Your Agency. In his course, Iman teaches people how to start their own SMMA step by step. He shows them how to get clients, how to run ads, and how to make a lot of money like he did. And man, his course was a huge hit. Thousands and thousands of people bought it. They were paying $1,000, $2,000, even $3,000 each to learn from Iman. In fact, Iman was making so much money from his course that it was doing even better than his actual SMMA business. So you know what he did? He shut down his SMMA completely, even though it was making $1.5 million in profit every year. He decided to focus 100% on selling his courses instead. Around this time, Iman also started to get really popular on YouTube. He was putting out these high quality videos about business and making money. In his videos, he always has nice clothes, nice cars, and he's traveling to cool places. He talks about how he lives this amazing life because of the money he's made, and people loved it. His YouTube channel blew up and became one of the fastest growing channels about money and business. Today, Iman has 4.9 million YouTube subscribers. Iman took his course and turned it into a big online school called Educate. It's kind of like how Andrew Tate has his real world program. People pay a monthly fee to get access to all of Iman's lessons. Some people have pointed out that Iman doesn't always tell the full truth about his life. For example, Iman talks a lot about how he was poor growing up. But he leaves out the fact that his stepdad was apparently a billionaire. Iman lived in a very rich area of London and went to a fancy private school. He even deleted some interviews where he mentioned this stuff. Also, some people think it's really weird that Iman completely shut down his super successful SMMA. Most people would have just hired someone else to run it while they worked on their courses. And when people looked up Iman's company money records, the numbers didn't match what Iman said he was making. This made some people think that maybe Iman's whole story and lifestyle is fake. Now, as Iman got more and more popular, his videos started to get a little crazy. He was telling people they needed to get rich super fast or they were losers. He even started talking about these wild ideas like how there's a group of puppet masters who control the world and want to keep everyone poor. A lot of his videos started to sound the same, just him repeating the same stuff over and over. But every once in a while, he'd make a big series of videos with really nice editing and music. These series would go on for hours and suck you in with a cool story. But at the end, it was always just Iman telling you to buy his course. So what can we learn from all this? Well, there's no doubt that Iman has done some really impressive things. He's made a ton of money and inspired a lot of people. But he's not perfect. No one is. Iman has definitely done some shady stuff and stretched the truth to make himself look better. I think the lesson is to be careful about who you listen to online. Don't believe everything you hear, even from people who seem really successful. Take the good advice and motivation you can from people like Iman, but always think for yourself. Don't fall for the tricks and lies, all right? That's the story of Iman Gadzi, the good and the bad.
a small village in Argentina, started pressure washing basketball courts, started, I will build the largest decentralized entrepreneurial network in the world known as Capital Club. This crypto millionaire isn't who he claims to be. The unbelievable dark truths behind Luke Belmar's million dollar empire will shock you. Lies, scams, cover-ups. The curtain is about to drop on this self-made guru's web of deception. Luke has a pretty incredible story. He was born in Argentina and he grew up without a lot of money. Life was tough for him and his family, but Luke had big dreams. When he was just 16 years old, he did something really brave. He decided to travel all the way to America by himself. And guess what? He only had $200 in his pocket. Brother, I started in a small village in Argentina. At the age of 16, I was fortunate enough to uh, have the ability to come to the United States. When Luke arrived in America, he had to work really hard to survive. He didn't have a nice place to live or a lot of money to buy food, so he took any job he could find. He cleaned dirty floors, washed basketball courts, and even worked at a restaurant called Buffalo Wild Wings. Started pressure washing basketball courts, started cleaning uh, dishes and restaurants and... Sometimes, Luke didn't even have enough money to rent a room to sleep in. He had to sleep in his car. Luke never gave up. He was determined to make a better life for himself. He started learning about different ways to make money using the internet. One of the things he learned about was selling stuff online. It's called e-commerce. He also learned about trading cryptocurrencies, which is like digital money. It's all very complicated, but Luke was smart and worked hard to understand it all. Luke got really, really good at making money with e-commerce and crypto trading. He made so much money that he didn't even know what to do with it all. My money initially through dropshipping or e-commerce. We had branded stores, general stores. We also had social media arbitrage. Now, when most people get rich, they just buy fancy cars and big houses. But not Luke. He wanted to do something different. He wanted to help other people get rich too. So he started this special club called Capital Club. The idea was to teach people how to make a lot of money and be successful in life just like Luke did. I will build the largest decentralized entrepreneurial network in the world known as Capital Club. Luke has some secrets that he doesn't want everyone to know. And some of these secrets are a little bit strange. First of all, Luke Belmar isn't even his real name. His actual name is Lucas Emmanuel Uratiai. Why would someone use a fake name? It's kind of like pretending to be someone you're not. Maybe Luke doesn't want people to know who he really is. Luke tries really hard to hide stuff about his past. Like this one time, there was a terrible attack that happened in a city called Berlin. It was a very sad and scary thing. Terrorist attack in Germany, a truck plowing into a crowd of tourists, out shopping for Christmas, killing at least 12. Luke was actually there when it happened, and he even did an interview with a news company about it. Later on, that interview completely disappeared from the internet. It's like it never even happened. Why would Luke want to hide that? It's all very mysterious. There are other things about Luke's story that don't add up, like he says he came to America all by himself when he was 16. But it turns out he had family living here the whole time. His brother Nate was trying to be a famous actor and model in America. But I guess that didn't work out so well for Nate. And it seems like Luke and his brother tried to hide all the information about Nate's acting career. They didn't want anyone to find out about it. When Luke's special club, Capital Club, first started, it cost a lot of money to join, like a crazy amount of money that most people don't have. But recently, Luke decided to make the price much lower. He says he wants more people to be able to join. Capital Club has some pretty sketchy things going on. There's this thing called an ambassador program, which is kind of like a pyramid scheme. That's when people make money by getting other people to join the club, and then those people get more people to join, and so on. The really bad part is that Capital Club lets people who are too young to join. You're supposed to be a grown-up to do this kind of stuff, but the club doesn't even check to make sure everyone is old enough. A lot of people in the club say that Luke doesn't even teach them anything useful about making money or starting a business. They say it's just a bunch of talk to make people feel excited, but it doesn't really help them in the real world. Luke's involvement with crypto in something called NFTs. NFTs are like special digital pictures or videos that people can buy and sell using cryptocurrency. It's all very new and confusing, but some people think NFTs are the future of art and collecting. Well, Luke tried to do his own NFT project called Divine Anarchy. He even made a secret Twitter account to talk about it. Divine Anarchy turned out to be a big disaster. Luke hired someone to help make the NFTs who didn't really know what they were doing. 
and that person made a huge mistake that caused a lot of people to lose their money. We're talking about over $2 million. Luke says it wasn't a scam, but it definitely shows that maybe he doesn't know as much about crypto and NFTs as he claims to. He likes to go on different shows and podcasts and say some really wild and crazy things. And he does it on purpose. Just so short video clips of him will spread all over the internet. The more people see and share these clips, the more famous Luke becomes. For example, one time Luke went on a show and told the host, who was a very young person, that everyone should do drugs called mushrooms. The host got really scared and uncomfortable because he knew it was a bad idea to tell people to do illegal drugs. But Luke didn't seem to care. He just wanted the clip to go viral and get more attention. Guys, mushrooms are crazy. Would you recommend them yes, to bro. me? Yes. Uh, to TJ? Me? <laughs> yes, bro. He's 18. In fact, Luke even admitted that he says shocking and crazy things on purpose without explaining them properly, just so people will talk about him more. Luke has a lot of secrets and has done some questionable things in his life. He's told lies, tried to hide parts of his past, and been involved in some sketchy business stuff. It's important to be aware of that, but at the same time, it's not all bad. Luke has also inspired a lot of people and motivated them to work hard and follow their dreams. He's shown that even if you come from a tough background, you can still achieve big things if you don't give up. That's a valuable lesson. So if you look up to Luke or want to learn from his story, that's totally fine. Just be sure to think for yourself and don't believe everything he says without question. Use your own judgment, and if something seems too good to be true or a little bit off, it probably is. We're all just trying to navigate through life the best we can. Luke's journey is definitely an interesting one, with lots of ups and downs. Take the good parts as inspiration and learn from the not so good parts. And above all, always strive to be honest and true to yourself and others, because in the long run, lying and hiding things will only come back to bite you. TikTokers have discovered a gold mine in the form of sharing movie clips. Getting paid on TikTok has literally never been easier. And in a healthy amount of views for your TikTok page to be making is somewhere between 400 and 1,000 views. Even this TikTok star makes $20,000 a month by stealing other people's content. His controversial methods have opened a heated debate about the ethics of clipping. Is he a clever entrepreneur or a ruthless thief? Let's find out. So what exactly is clipping? It's basically when someone takes clips from other creators' long-form content, like YouTube videos or Twitch streams, edits them into short TikToks, and posts them on their own page to get views and followers. Clippers can make a lot of money doing this, but many argue it's stealing content and unethical. Musa cranks out around 10 TikTok clips per hour just on his phone. He takes the best moments from YouTubers, Twitch streamers, and other creators, and edits them into short videos. One single clip can get over a million views and make around $1,000 on average. Musa runs over 30 TikTok pages and posts over 60 clips per month on each one. This allows him to make upwards of $30,000 every month just from clipping, which is crazy. Daily. So you only need 10,000 followers and 100,000 views in the past 30 days, which is tiny. It's really, really easy to achieve. Some in early 2023, TikTok launched a new program that allows creators to get paid if they have over 10,000 followers and post videos longer than one minute. The views and engagement on the video determine how much you earn. Roughly 1 million views equals $1,000. So if you post a lot of clips across many pages that all go viral, you can make some serious cash like Musa does. It's a numbers game. More clips and more views means more money. Many people are calling out Musa and other clippers for building a business off of other people's hard work. The original creators put in the effort to film entertaining content, but the clippers are the ones profiting off the best parts. Some say this is straight up theft and copyright infringement. The clippers don't have permission from the creators to repost their content and are making money that should be going to the original creator instead. It feels unfair for the hardworking creators. Whether you like it or not, by me taking your content and repurposing it, it will benefit you. Musa argues that clipping actually helps the original creators by giving them more exposure to the TikTok audience. He believes it's a mutually beneficial relationship where the creator gets free publicity and the clipper gets views. Musa says he always credits the creator in the description and if he ever gets a request from a creator to take a video down, he will respect that. But he hasn't gotten many removal requests, so he thinks most creators are fine with it. The debate gets even more complex when you look at the legality of it all. 
Musa claims he consulted lawyers who told him clipping is legal as long as the clips are transformative, meaning he's adding some of his own editing or commentary to make it different from the original. But others argue that clipping still violates copyright law, specifically the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. Under the DMCA, reposting copyrighted content without permission is illegal, even if you give credit. The only real exception is fair use, which allows limited use of content for criticism, news reporting, teaching, or research. It's unclear if clipping would qualify as fair use or not. You could argue the clippers are providing a service by curating the best parts for the TikTok audience, but you could also argue they're just free riding off others' creativity to make a quick buck. The ethics of clipping are complicated with valid arguments on both sides. I can understand why creators would be frustrated to see others get rich off their content, but I can also see how clipping could be a win-win to reach a new audience if done respectfully. Ultimately, I think it depends on the creator's wishes. If a creator is explicitly against people clipping their content, the clipper should respect that. But if the creator is okay with clips or hasn't expressed any opinion, I don't think the clipper is necessarily in the wrong, as long as they follow best practices, like crediting and removing clips if asked. What makes this issue even thornier is that Musa isn't just clipping for himself. He's actually teaching others how to do it too through an exclusive Discord group called Media Metas. For $40 a month, members get access to Musa's clipping courses, resources, and one-on-one -on -one support from his team. Based on the number of active members, it's estimated Musa makes at least $32,000 a month just from the Media Meta subscriptions. That's on top of what he makes from his own clipping. Inside the group, there's also a marketplace where people can buy and sell popular TikTok pages to jumpstart their clipping business. Musa himself has helped some big name creators like Sneeko grow their presence using clipping. He took Sneeko from zero to six billion views on TikTok and over $150,000 in YouTube ad revenue in a single month. So Musa is almost acting as a clipping agent, using his expertise to help other people go viral and monetize. He's built a whole business model around this concept of clipping. On one hand, you could say Musa is just teaching others how to work smarter, not harder. His techniques have clearly been successful for himself and his clients. He's helping smaller creators grow a following they might not have been able to on their own. But on the flip side, this almost feels like he's running a content mill that's mass producing these TikTok clips at an industrial scale. It's not just a few clips here and there. He's encouraging an army of people to flood the app with repurposed content. I worry this could hurt the original creators even more and drown out organic content on the platform. So what's the solution here? How do we protect creators work while still allowing for this new genre of clipping content to exist? I have a few ideas. Clippers need to commit to properly crediting the original creator in a clear and visible way, not just hidden in a description or comment. Maybe TikTok could add a feature that automatically links to the original video. TikTok should create an official way for creators to opt out of allowing clips of their content. This could be a setting you toggle on or off. That way creators have more control. If a creator asks a clipper to remove their content, the clipper needs to comply immediately, no questions asked. Musa says he already does this, which is good. There needs to be a better way to report potential copyright infringement on TikTok. Right now, the process is complicated and most creators probably don't know how. TikTok should make it more user-friendly to flag stolen content. Clippers who are profiting should consider a revenue sharing model where a portion of their earnings go back to the original creator. This feels more fair than the clipper keeping 100% of the money. Even just a 20% cut could go a long way. Creators should be proactive about protecting their content by posting it on TikTok themselves first. That way they have a better claim if someone else clips it. Creators could even make their own official clip channels to beat the clippers to the punch. I'd like to see TikTok take a harder stance against accounts that are clearly just stealing content with no transformative purpose. If an account's entire page is just other people's content, that's a red flag. Maybe they could get a warning before being banned. The goal is to find a middle ground where clipping can coexist with original content in a way that feels ethical and respectful to the creators. It's a tricky balance, but I believe there are steps we can take to make it better for everyone. What do you think? Do you agree with Musa that clipping helps creators? Is hustle culture really the key to success? 
Or could it be harming you more than helping? Today, we will explore the darker side of Gary Vee's relentless work ethic and uncover the hidden costs of his extreme advice. Gary Vaynerchuk, commonly known as Gary Vee, is a well-known entrepreneur, author, motivational speaker, and internet personality. However, behind his brash personality, colorful language, and unconventional business advice lies a darker side that warrants exploration. His relentless promotion of hustle culture, extreme work ethic, and advice that often dismisses the importance of work-life balance and mental health have raised significant concerns. In one of his videos aimed at 20-year-olds, Gary Vaynerchuk advises viewers to work extremely long hours for the next decade to achieve their goals. He states, I gave up my entire 20s, all of them. Imagine not doing anything fun or going anywhere for the next eight years, including Saturdays and Sundays. That's what I did from 22 to 30. From 20 to 30, I did nothing. I went all in. No outs, no out, no out, no out. No yeah. burger place, no club. Many viewers have criticized this advice, calling it downright harmful. While Vaynerchuk's message emphasizes the importance of hard work and dedication, his advice to give up your entire 20s has received significant criticism. Many argue that such extreme hours can result in burnout, mental health issues, and a poor work-life balance. Critics suggest that this approach sets unrealistic expectations and neglects the importance of enjoying life and fostering relationships during one's 20s. Vaynerchuk argues that the next five-year window is when you should take risks and attack the life you want to win. He believes this is the best and easiest time to pursue what you love because you have fewer responsibilities and expectations. However, experts argue that while ambition is important, it's crucial to maintain a healthy work-life balance, especially in your 20s. The key is to work hard and smart, but also make time for relationships, hobbies, and self-care. Vaynerchuk's advice to work 7 a.m. to 2 a.m. every day for eight years straight is likely not sustainable or advisable for most people. The best approach is to find a pace that allows you to make consistent progress on your goals while still taking care of yourself and enjoying life. Moderation and balance are important, even for highly ambitious people. Impact on young minds. Gary Vee's influence on young minds is another area of concern. His audience often includes teenagers and young adults who are still shaping their views on work, success, and life. The pressure to conform to his ideals can lead to anxiety, depression, and a skewed perception of success. Critics argue that this approach promotes a skewed perception of success, suggesting that it is only achievable through constant work and sacrifice. This narrow definition of success can overshadow other important aspects of life, such as mental well-being, personal relationships, and self-discovery. They emphasize the need for more balanced and nuanced guidance that encourages young people to pursue their goals while also fostering a holistic approach to their development. Such guidance would help young individuals navigate the complexities of modern life without compromising their overall well-being. Vaynerchuk heavily promotes a hustle culture mindset that encourages people to sacrifice their mental health and personal lives in pursuit of success. His approach of working 18-hour days and sacrificing leisure time and personal relationships for success is viewed by some as unhealthy and unsustainable. Critics argue that this message can create unrealistic expectations and pressure, especially among young entrepreneurs who may feel inadequate if they can't match his intense work ethic. He has been criticized for pushing an unrealistic and potentially damaging view of what it takes to be successful. Another criticism of Gary Vee is his tendency to oversimplify the path to success. His advice often emphasizes hard work and persistence, downplaying the roles of luck, privilege, and systemic barriers. While hard work is undeniably important, this perspective can overlook the complexities and nuances of different individuals' circumstances, leading to a one-size-fits-all approach that may not be applicable to everyone. Vaynerchuk's advice seems to dismiss the importance of work-life balance and taking breaks. As one critic put it, the message that, if you don't just spend all hours of your life working, you'll never be a success, affects everyone if they believe in it even in the slightest bit because of the guilt loops it sets up. Some of Gary Vee's advice has been criticized for being impractical or even counterproductive. For example, his emphasis on quitting one's job to pursue entrepreneurship without a safety net can be risky and financially disastrous for those without substantial savings or a clear plan. Additionally, his insistence on leveraging social media, 
to an extreme extent, can lead to overexposure and burnout. Gary Vee's content primarily targets aspiring entrepreneurs and young professionals, many of whom are vulnerable and looking for guidance. Critics argue that his motivational speeches and advice can exploit these individuals' hopes and dreams for personal gain. By selling books, courses, and other products, he profits from the very audience he claims to want to help, raising questions about the authenticity of his intentions. Critics argue that Gary Vee's vast amount of free content serves primarily as a funnel to his paid products. Gary Vee's relentless positivity can be seen as toxic positivity, where his insistence on always maintaining a positive outlook can invalidate real struggles and negative emotions. This approach can pressure individuals to hide their true feelings and maintain a facade of positivity which can harm their health. Critics like Dr. Yaimi Zuckerman argue that this mindset forces people to suppress their true emotions. Personal accounts and social media reactions reflect this concern, indicating that Gary Vee's constant positivity can make individuals feel worse when they can't always be upbeat, highlighting the need for a more balanced approach to emotional experiences. When people feel they can't express negative emotions, it can lead to internalized stress, potentially worsening anxiety and depression symptoms. Vaynerchuk has repeatedly argued that traditional media like TV advertising is ineffective compared to social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram. He recommends that brands spend their entire marketing budget on these channels. However, marketing expert Mark Ritson argues that this advice is hilariously wrong-headed and fails to consider strategic requirements before making media decisions. Why is he wrong? While using Facebook and Instagram for marketing is common and often effective, it shouldn't be the only strategy. It's unwise to recommend specific tactics without first understanding the brand's strategic goals. The effectiveness of social media marketing depends on factors like the brand's image, the target audience, specific marketing objectives. Award-winning marketing campaigns typically use a mix of channels, not just social media. Even Facebook acknowledges that its advertising works best when combined with other methods, like TV ads. The main point is that while social media marketing can be valuable, it shouldn't be the only strategy. A diverse, multi-channel approach tailored to a brand's specific needs and goals is generally more effective. Some critics argue that Gary Vaynerchuk tends to overemphasize his background story, potentially creating a narrative that doesn't fully acknowledge the advantages he had. While he refutes claims of being a glorified trust fund baby, emphasizing his family's escape from poverty and his hard work, this aspect remains contentious. While Gary V has undoubtedly inspired many with his energetic approach to entrepreneurship and digital marketing, it's crucial to examine the darker aspects of his influence. His relentless promotion of hustle culture, oversimplification of the path to success, and potential exploitation of vulnerable audiences are significant concerns. These issues highlight the need for a more balanced perspective that recognizes the importance of work-life balance and the complexities of individual circumstances. Aspiring entrepreneurs and young professionals should critically evaluate the advice they receive, including from influential figures like Gary Vee. Success is not a one-size-fits-all journey, and it's vital to find a personal path that includes hard work and ambition without sacrificing overall well-being. Remember, achieving your goals should not come at the expense of your health, relationships, and happiness.